Um, this is Meredith Ryder with OHA, and this is the licensing subcommittee meeting for Thursday, January 3rd. And I've enabled closed captioning. So if anyone wants to use that or follow along with the transcription, um, you can feel free to click the button for that. Wonderful. Thank you, Meredith. Um, so hi, folks. Um, I am not Mason Marks today, but I have been asked to help moderate uh, the training subcommittee today. Today is going to be um, a little different. We have a couple of presentations um, from folks that will be given with a Q&A session for members of the board. Um, so I will go ahead um, and call this meeting to order and conduct roll call. Um, so first we have Barb Hansen. I'm here. And Kim Galetz. I'm here. Uh, Dr. Rachel Knox. Uh, Sarah Present. I'm here. Great. Uh, Mason Marks is not here. And I am Anne Marie Backstrom, and I am here. So um, great. With that, um, we won't be voting on anything today, so we don't need a quorum. And it looks like I will send it over to Jesse Sweet from OHA for an OHA update. Thank you. Um, just as a matter of housekeeping, um, we are now doing transcriptions of these Zoom meetings. Um, and when we get the written transcript back, it does not identify the speaker. So when you're making uh, remarks, if you can remember to say your name at the outset, that's very helpful in terms of producing a, a usable transcript. Um, another thing I'd like to touch on is just the, the rulemaking process generally. Um, we're going to see a couple uh, guest speakers today. And um, for one of the guest speakers, uh, John Dennis, he has prepared some documents that look very much like administrative rules. Um, he has even gone to the trouble of uh, putting correct citations in them to the ballot measure. Um, so uh, good formatting, John. Uh, there's certainly nothing wrong with that. But um, I did want to make sure that everybody uh, on the call knows that you know these are not uh, an OHA work product. These are John's presentation documents uh, for information only. Um, as far as the rulemaking process goes, OHA is going to get uh, input from three places, the Rules Advisory Committee, uh, and we'll be holding our first Rules Advisory Committees uh, in February, the public comment period, which uh, for the early rules will run April 1st through April 21st, and from the recommendations that we get from the board. Um, also, I would like to remind everybody that the rulemaking I just referenced is a subset of the larger rules. Um, we have expedited certain rule sections, and those are the ones that we're going to be taking up um, first. Later in the summer, we will be tackling <clears throat> the remainder of the rules. Um, so we will have public comment periods for the remainder of the rules in November of this year. Uh, as always, keep an eye on our website. Uh, all of this information will be posted. And I look forward to the presentations. For the record, this is Anne Marie. Um, thank you so much, Jesse. Um, so, as we said, we have a couple of presentations today, um, followed by a QA by our board and subcommittee members. And first up, we're going to be hearing um, a presentation from Bob Otis to talk about um, the sacred garden community. Um, Bob, are you present and ready to uh, to go? Hi, uh, yes, I'm, I'm here. Thankful to be here. Wonderful. And can you state your name for the record, please? Hi, Robert Bob Otis Stanley. Great. Thank you. And I'll, I'll let you present. Yeah, well, first, I just want to take a minute and uh, really express gratitude for this, this uh, little group here, which may even be kind of forming its own community. So just, uh, you know, gratitude for, to be in community with everyone here, and particularly for the work that you're doing, and that we can be here. And even just to take a step back, and consider my role as a pastor within Sacred Garden Community and just to express all that we can even be together, that we can even just experience a breath, that we are seeking healing together, we're seeking to be supporting healing together. I'm very thankful for, for what I sense are the shared intentions of this group 
may the time that I spend with you and the time that we spend together bring us uh, into the direction that we're seeking to go into who we truly are, and particularly for healing and insight and joy for our communities. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I thought maybe I'd, uh, often what I do is a lot of my role is to kind of share experience and needs uh, from the ground, uh, from a place of practice and from a place of long practice. Uh, so I don't have a lot of documents to share, but I thought I would kind of share how uh, things go within Sacred Garden community. And I probably should start with a little bio, um, also to bring up any awareness, uh, transparency, so just to, to avoid any uh, perception of conflict and that sort of thing. So I'll just kind of try to give a brief bio. Um, I've been working in this space. I was really fortunate to be able to approach my father openly. Uh, even when I was 17 years old, he was a uh, a surgeon and the chief of staff at our hospital in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And I had been able to explore his library and had found books by uh, Charles Tart and John Lilly. And this was a while ago. So these are some of the older books. Carlos Castaneda was there. And so I felt safe to uh, approach him about a really profound and transformative mystical experience I had at age 17, a pretty young age. Uh, sitting on the top of a mountain in the Smoky Mountains. And it was really life-changing and I'm still integrating that experience and subsequent experiences even, even today. Um, so I've been able to work with family and recognized leadership, you know, formal faculty from Harvard, Psychedelic Club and those sort of folks for over 35 years. If you search for Bob Otis, Psychedelic Liberty and Diversity, you'll find a really long bio for me online. I think Psychedelics Times published that. I think I was just trying to calculate this out and I'm confident I've sat in, in facilitation with over a thousand practitioners, I think well over. Uh, I have a master's of divinity from University of Chicago where I studied with Wendy Doniger who co-wrote with uh, Richard Evan Schultes. I also have over 20 years of life science research uh, as my above ground profession. I am the chief garden steward and ordained pastor for Sacred Garden Community Church. I'm the co-founder and chief sacrament officer of Momosa Public Benefit Corp, co-founded with Amanda Fielding, Jim Kime, and others. Uh, there is funding from Bronner Foundation and others associated with that company, just expressing disclosure here. I'm an invited advisory council member to the California SB 519. I'm an advisor to the Oregon PMHA, uh, also recently invited to advise the Colorado uh, uh, Natural Medicine Healing Alliance. Um, I'm also a founding member and, steer and steering committee member of the Sacred Plant Alliance of Shakruna. So the little, little background there. <clears throat> and also want to, uh, I'm not sure how you guys will do this, but if anyone wants to interrupt with questions, I'm happy to receive questions at, at any time. And Ms. Stan Marie, for the record, um, I just want to state that we will open up for public comment at the end. So as far um, as questions currently are concerned, um, if board members do have questions, uh, just state your name for the record. We can take it from there. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So I thought I would talk a little bit about um, Sacred Garden community, particularly in context of the benefits of persisting community as a part of uh, what I'll call healing practice with uh, entheogenic materials. Um, there are a lot of reasons why having sort of a, a some formed organization that it is governed can be useful for sacred plant work, and particularly if there's a community of practitioners uh, that can be accessed. Um, one thing I'll kind of bring up right out of the gate that can confuse folks uh, within sacred garden community and the trainings that we offer, we call the uh, person who may be holding space, the facilitator, and we call the person who is seeking healing or insight, uh, the practitioner. So we recognize that the active practice is actually carried by the person who is seeking the experience and engaging the, uh, the, the antigen directly. So that's a little different. Some people think of the practitioner as the, the facilitator, but we recognize the agency of, of the person doing the practice. Just wanna avoid any confusion when I'm chatting. Um, so sacred garden community, we, you know, we have all those things that you need to have and an internal ethics council, which is separate from the elders council or the, what is the board equivalent. Um, we're also associated with an external regulatory association. That's the sacred plan alliance that's, that's uh, hosted by Shakruna. So that if there are issues within the, the church, if there's any question about facilitator impropriety 
or anything like that. First, uh, there's an opportunity to go to the Ethics Council with a complaint. The Ethics Council then raised that to the Elders Council and some decision may be made. <clears throat> if there's a conflict between Elders and Ethics Council or, or some irresolvable conflict, we go out to an external body. And I would sort of generally recommend that uh, whether this is for a therapeutic training association or a, therapy, uh, a, a little group that's offering uh, uh, hosted facilitation, you know, to have access to an independent ethics council and, uh, and really probably an external, some external regulatory association, I think is very useful. So this is the sort of thing I know you guys are uh, building in here. So I'm just bringing that up. Um, Trying to decide what's really useful to share. Uh, you know, within Sacred Garden Community, we have our own ongoing facilitation and practitioner training. So we really take a lot of time with each person who's seeking healing before we, we simply uh, drop them into the journey space or the assisted meditation. We'll take at least three months with any person who's seeking healing getting to know that person, asking them to attend at least eight educational workshops that we offer, moving through a formal process that includes navigation, preparation. Uh, we also have an initiatory process. So we don't uh, move the person into the first experience of assisted meditation with a, a, a strong experience for the very first experience. We ask the person to move with respect uh, into the process. So we move through navigation preparation, and then we have a, a gentle initiation, uh, which is uh, an assisted meditation, but a light one. Uh, depending on how that goes, we may have several initiatory meditations. Then we move into what we call the practice, and that is, uh, is, can be deeper assisted meditations. By that time, the facilitation leadership has gotten to know that person and can really identify probably what sacrament would be most useful for them in their practice. That's, that's an interactive relationship where we learn that sort of thing. Um, and then moving th the person into the practice from where they are. And that is something that you don't just learn in one hour interview, in my opinion. It's, it really helps to take some real time to get to know the person who's seeking uh, a healing before you just drop them in. You know, Just to sort of fly in and, and have an interview and fly out is not the way that we do things. I feel that that can add risk. Um, and have had that experience from, from just, if you don't really know who you're sitting with, there's a lot of additional risk there. We also then of course uh, work through integration. And then something that I think is really important that may get missed is, is a concept of community integration. Does the person have a place to return to uh, that, that is healing, that is, is, is aligned with the intentions of the process that the person is moving through, right? And so to have some form of community that's transparent and open about the intentions of the community, that it's a, a community intended for healing, that there are resources for, for integration within that community and experienced resources for integration uh, is, is incredibly valuable. There are issues that folks here are probably aware of that can be challenging emerging from an assisted meditation, like for example, inflation. People may have heard that term. Sometimes uh, a newcomer to the entheogen space will have such a profound experience. It, it will be such a sense of receiving insight and such a strong sense of um, having moved through uh, maybe some uh, really deep emotional challenges that person was suffering. Occasionally coming out of that, there can be a real sense of what I'll call and what Ann Shulgin calls inflation. Um, that That's the sense of, uh, you know, I can, I really learned everything. I'm like a prophet and, and I know more than everyone else. And, you know, this, this sort of thing that can, that can be a challenge coming out of entheogen work. So having a community or at least a persisting relationship with it, with an experienced therapist who has seen that sort of thing before can be very helpful. You know, I was really lucky when I was 17 that I was able to talk to my dad and my family has a, a sort of mystic religious background. And he says, you know, Bob, you're not the only person who's experienced God and, you know, let's talk about this and, and, you know, kind of ground ourselves. Similarly, a person can come out of journey with a lot of shame or unresolved uh, issues that might have emerged during the journey. Someone may, something may be realized that may be very difficult. Um, and if you don't have guidance that this is a process that you can be moving through and that this is really a good opportunity, 
you know, having that community with that experience, then uh, that you can actually come out of the assisted meditation with uh, less health, right? And so, but to have that uh, community support then can actually turn that sort of challenging journey into an opportunity. So I think whether this quote community is provided by an, a sort of a, an attuned relationship with a therapist uh, type of sitter or whatever that may be, or through an actual community, having that is incredibly important. Uh, at least that's what we believe within Sacred Garden community based on our ex experience. So I hope you can hear through this kind of a deliberate harm reduction process that's being built into community structure. In some ways, I feel a, a, a big, uh, what we call least dogma church that can, that can hold a lot of diverse faiths. Um, but then we have a common faith, which in our church, it's that the, the sacraments of our church approached, approached with care, respect, and trust can connect us directly to divine uh, presence, to experience of divine presence within this lifetime. That's our common faith, but we can accept many incoming uh, faiths, atheism, Christ Christian, Jewish, Islamic, pagan, you name it. Um, so we're trying to create a, a strong container that can hold the diversity that we find here in Oakland, uh, but also we'll have a sincerely shared faith. And in some ways I feel by trying to create this persisting community framework uh, that, that has deliberate harm reduction built in, we're, we're recreating some of the benefits that are found in, in long-term culture uh, that, for example, I've experienced through uh, the, the many years that I've visited the Sierra Mazatecan region and gotten to know different curanderos and curanderos down there. You know, each little village, each little valley that will have one or two or several curanderos will have a, a culture that is integrated with that healing process. And we're lacking that generally here in the United States. So to have a, an intentionally created community that can provide some of the support frameworks that you may find in other traditional cultures as part of our goal. Just talking kind of about the church and some of the justification for why it exists and, and hopefully some of the benefits that, that we're seeing that might uh, be useful for this group. I will say Sacred Garden Community Church has been practicing for decades. Uh, um, I've been giving plant talks, uh, you know, here in the Bay Area for, I guess, since about 2014 or so openly when I started feeling safer to do that. And um, we've been a formal incorporated church now, I think, for about two and a half years. Also, I'll just mention uh, seeking that transparency and safety and a sense of openness uh, and uh, what we call care, respect, and trust, uh, a sense of trust and integrity. Uh, three uh, of the five um, board members for the Decrim Nature Oakland movement when it was passing uh, through in Oakland, what were Sacred Garden Community. So I was the chair, the founding chair of the Decrim Na Nature group. And that was a part of the, of the ethos that we're trying to share is one of, um, the, of our commitment and dedication to honesty, openness, transparency, safety. And really for us, for Sacred Garden Community, the Decrim Nature uh, process in Oakland was really like a, a prayer. It was like a careful, respectful, and trusting request for transparency and safety in Oakland. And, and I'll be really honest, I, I kept having these journeys that were puzzling me where, where, where I was receiving first years ago, there's, no, there's nothing to be ashamed of. You don't need to be hiding. And then I guess around 2016, 17, I was getting, uh, you can sit with the elders of your village. And that I think turned into a lot of the motivation, particularly when a li literal elder in our community was having health issues and would fall down and things I wanted to be able to call 911 and feel safe about that. And uh, I realized that we could go to the elders of, of our village and, and we were received with a lot of trust and I'm really thankful. When decrim uh, nature became much more political, a, a couple of, of uh, the other leadership really wanted to take it national and had a, a, a kind of a, what we felt was a rather aggressive political approach. Um, the sacred garden community dropped out. We were really just seeking our own safety and healing for ourselves to do good practice and we were happy to let that, that group go. Um, I think I've talked a little bit about some of the challenges and opportunities, uh, particularly around community-based healing. 
uh, talking about having that framework to return to after meditation that can be guiding, can help with integration, grounding, uh, and even moving into community integration to share your knowledge and to grow service and other things that can be deeply healing. Um, also to allow time for the practitioner, the seeker to find their affinity um, with, so that, that also I've learned through working, particularly in Oakland with the diversity here, you know, there's a, there's a lot of diversity and unfortunately for many of us, that diversity is associated with trauma uh, of all kinds that's been historical and ongoing. So there can be challenges to sitting in ceremony uh, with diversity, um, particularly from folks who may have experienced trauma from someone who looks like someone else in that ceremony. So one of the things that Sacred Garden Community has had to do a lot of work, and I know that um, Oregon is, is trying to focus well in this way, is, is to offer diversity in the facilitation roles, which is extremely important so that the seeker can find an affinity uh, that will work for them. You just can't ask someone to sit in that open and vulnerable space uh, with someone who may be uh, related to a lot of trauma in, in the history of their family. So to, to have that diverse leadership to hold space for the diverse community also seems to be extremely important. Um, Let's see, other, other concepts to share here. One of the, now this is something that I recognize can be a little bit sensitive um, for sacred garden community. And for me personally, these, these are sacraments, the things we're discussing, Nino Santos, the little mushroom, psilocybin, uh, the spirit of the mushroom. You know, it's a sacred, for me, spirit. It can help connect to something which is beyond words. You could, we call it in sacred garden community, divine. We recognize there may be many different names for, for, for this experience uh, that, that we can sh often share a, a sense of. And um, so we frame our church as a church and we're very sincere about that. Uh, and I do feel that there's an interesting line of the sort of secular therapeutic practice and the experience of something that is that may be perceived as deeply sacred or even uh, divine or godlike to the to the person who's seeking. So I think to have some mature way of uh, relating to these concepts of sacred, divine, uh, maybe numinous, noetic, godlike, uh, satori, you know, whatever those experiences may be, I think can be useful as a part of the healing process, not to be pushing that, but to be able to speak in a, an, an open and, and the way we prefer within sacred garden community, uh, not sort of non-sectarian way about this experience to recognize that this is an experience that we can all have and um, to be able to hold that the person who is who is expressing their awareness of something that that is divine without uh, coercing one way or the other or in trying to influence but just to hear that and to allow that I think can be very important. Um, this can also be very deeply healing for communities in terms of helping reconnect reconnecting to traditions of your family often people will realize meaning uh, from their religious tradition that, that they hadn't realized prior to engaging these experiences. So now it's like, oh, I think I, I think I understood what Rumi meant when he said this, or I think I understood what, what Jesus meant when he said love as, as I do. You know, so people can really gain a, a reconnection to the traditions of their families, uh, but maybe from a, a deeper way. Like for example, my father who lives in Tennessee is a, a fairly uh, far right conservative person um, who's a, a, in a Christian tradition. I tend to be much farther left and, and my, a lot of my training has been in indigenous and traditional as well as Buddhist and other. Um, my master's of divinity degree was comparative we're able to move through those political and religious differences because we both had deep antigenic experiences together and we're aware that there's meaning and experience that is far more profound and important than any words that we can use so we can we can sort of let go of the words that are are dividing us and and sense that the divine presence that that is uh, unifying us, which also seems to be very healing in a community space. And I'm bringing that up in part because 
something else happens with antigen work, which is that a lot of what someone might call shadow, trauma, demons, you know, whatever language you may use, that can, that can emerge in, in uh, antigen space. And often that can take the, role, the, the sort of sense of political urgency or, I, or that I've been harmed by, you know, someone or something. And so along with healing, as, as we're moving through our healing process, these challenging uh, experiences can emerge that are associated with current and, 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 uh, and historical trauma. And so there can also be a, a really difficult sort of direction towards division that can move out of sacred plant work. And I want to bring that up here because I think this is something that's a little sensitive and we're struggling with the sort of politics and position and power uh, and antigens, right? So that's, that's something that can come up. Um, within sacred garden community, we're really trying to emphasize radical inclusion, recognizing that a right-wing person from Tennessee, as well as a left-wing person from Oakland, uh, are, are, we are all worthy to receive healing. We're all worthy to uh, grow insight. That insight may uh, take the form of different language, right? And um, I think we have a risk right now uh, because a lot of the uh, antigen work is emerging in politically progressive areas of mistaking the message of the sacred plants with the message, for example, of a far, we far left political movement. And I'm not saying I personally identify with a, a, a relatively far left kind of political position, but we're really trying to be careful within sacred guard and community at least to recognize that the healing that we experience, it may actually be something that sort of frees us from the dogma of our position and allows us to see diverse perspectives and allows us to recognize that there may be meaning that's deeper than the words and the sort of fights that we have. Um, and that's a challenge and that's not something that we've moved through, but that's a message that at least I'm trying to share that these antigens can, can bring up the demons that divide us and make those very clear and cl can clarify those things. But I'm asking us not to identify with those demons, but rather to ask them, you know, how can we, I'll use a sort of cliche, how can we feed those demons love in a way that we can also learn to become more closely connected with those from whom we may uh, have different uh, ways of defining our experience of the world. So that, that's a little bit of the ch some of the challenges and opportunities that I'm finding around community healing. All right, I think I'm doing okay for time and I'll wrap up here in just a little, uh, a minute. Yeah, this uh, also, is Anne Marie. Yeah, go ahead, uh, take a couple more minutes and then we'll open it up to questions from the board. Fantastic, really good. So at the very last, I thought I would talk a little bit about sort of the intersection of traditional practice and modern practice and even a uh, fancy word, sort of a positive postmodern. You know, my divinity uh, studies at University of Chicago were focusing in epistemology and how we know things. And I was really thankful to have the just profound privilege of being able to uh, have a real comparative experience of traditional practices going to Brazil, uh, even experiencing a bruja ceremony in the Philippines, uh, Guatemala, uh, many journeys in Mexico, um, like that, as well as throughout the United States, and um, and also engaging modern practice, having journeys with Anne and Sasha Shulgin and Terrence McKenna, and, and studying with uh, Frank Barron from from the Harvard Club, and so looking at these things together, I feel that there are some maybe some messages that might be useful. Um, you know, it, it is, I'm also thankful to have had the privilege to have traveled and to have received permissions to return traditional plants and practices to the United States and permissions to share those plants and practices. So that's something that I'm grateful for, but recognizing that not everyone has that privilege, I'm thankful that Oregon is looking at ways of moving these, these what I consider sacraments into communities uh, through other routes. Um, Within Sacred Garden community, we're integrating our, our experiences of traditional practices. For example, the practices that I'm most familiar with in the, Sierra, in the Mazatecan regions of Mexico, um, and also the modern practices using language around, for example, trauma and, uh, and shadow work and, and things like this. So we, we really try to recognize that there may be different languages and cultures that are describing some processes that may vary from person to person and culture and culture, but that are also similar. So we're really uh, trying to understand those things. 
part of this, which may be a little touchy for this group, is uh, my teachers in Mexico. And our own experience has been that working with multiple sacraments, not only, for example, psilocybin, can be extremely important uh, and very useful. There are folks who are in different places in their lives and different sacraments may have different uh, really important benefits, and it may be difficult to move through a different experience uh, that a different sacrament may bring. For example, if a person is dealing with a lot of deep shame or a lot of deep anger, uh, psilocybin can be quite challenging. And depending on where the person is coming from, that might be something that could even bring them into more of a spiraling uh, sense. If you have you know four or six hours where you're just experiencing nothing but really deep shame, it can be very hard to integrate uh, that person might really benefit by MDMA work, for example, to start. And, and you want to have a careful intake with health and safety screening, preferably from, in my opinion, often it would be beneficial to have a trained clinical therapist or at least someone with a very long history of experience, not someone who's just gone through 160 hours of training. You want to do a really careful health and safety screening. Take your time with that. Avoiding work, I would propose in the United States with people who are over on the psychosis side of the spectrum, focusing more on the neurosis side of the spectrum. Uh, you need to do that sort of work and then identify the sacrament that's really most effective for that person where they are. And that can be a conversation. We would start with an initiatory practice, not just a big, you know, five grams of mushrooms right out of the gate for, for someone. There are also, also are people who are low responders or consistent non-responders to psilocybin, but may respond quite effectively to phenethylamines. So that's like mescaline or some other uh, compound. So that's something that I've absolutely seen in my practice, low responders and non-responders to psilocybin can be a real issue, um, even without, with or without taking SSRI. So that, that there are those things that you find when you're working with high numbers. Um, so there are some ideas I wanted to share there around multiple sacraments. And I would like to, at this point, express a lot of gratitude for the teachers who have uh, helped me get to where I am now. Thank you, Maximiano. Thanks you, thank you, Maria. And thank you to this group for allowing me to talk. Thank you. Yeah, Marie, Bob, thank you so, so much for that. Um, and I wanna open it up to um, our board members and subcommittee members, if you have um, any questions that you wanna pose. I have lots of questions. <laughs> may I, may I yeah. jump in? Okay. Um, uh, thank you so much for joining us. I have to change my view here a little bit so I can see you. Um, I'm Sarah President. I'm a family physician and a local public health officer representing uh, health officers on the um, on the board here. Um, I have a couple of, um, and thank you. Thank you for um, being here and telling us about your work and giving us uh, this really nice kind of idea of, of one of the frameworks that our program here in Oregon can help support. I appreciate I appreciate it very much. Um, some very kind of specific how things work questions and then a couple of broader questions um, and I'll be quick. Um, I'm curious about the size of your community um, sort of in general, as well as the size of um, groups that may be going under, or maybe undergoing entheogenic experiences together, um, as well as that sort of facilitator to practitioner um, ratio. I, I'm curious what you have seen work, not work, um, and anything you have to guide us around that. Mm -hmm. um, I am also curious about sort of how your community and the makeup of seekers and the makeup of community has changed since uh, this, your website says you became sort of above ground in April of 2020. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's an interesting time um, for a shift in community. I'm curious about that. Um, and then I have lots more, but my final one right now is, is there anything that you've heard our subcommittee discussing or our board discussing in general that makes you nervous around your type of community being supported by the program that we're building here in Oregon? Okay, got it. Concerns. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, and nice to be meeting. Yeah, appreciate the questions. Yeah. Um, church size. Uh, so this is a really lovely and interesting question. Someone was asking me recently, it's like, when did you think the church was really founded? And uh, and I, and we were feeling sort of deep. And and I really mean this sincerely, though. It's like, I, I think in some sense, the church was founded, you know, th through millennia of ancestral work, you know, so it's, it's a process that I think my family, which I could express as a, were Quakers, uh, 
until very recently. And then uh, on my dad's side of the family, there are two doctors and two preachers and a nurse who married a preacher, you know, so this is sort of in this tradition. So I don't, it's hard to say, but I, I have been practicing with groups uh, since I was 19, I'm 55 now, um, and was practicing with sacred garden community as an etheric body, right, uh, for, 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 for decades here in Oakland. Um, that started to grow Facebook and social media and everything started happening. So uh, Open Garden, Sacred Garden Community, Open Garden Sundays website that people joined as members, that's got like 650 people. I don't really think that counts, right? But if I really splash it out, then there can be 150 people will show up at the garden. But in terms of committed members who have moved through the process and been confirmed as practitioners, I think we're at about 50 right now that we've got that formal practice. And then we've got about 150 who sort of regularly are, are attending, you know, but they, they haven't been confirmed as practitioners. We, we really take our time before we, we, we confirm practitioners. We move through a process. Let's see. In terms of facility, and a big part of that was I, I have been practicing, but it was always kind of small groups more like careful seekers. And then something started happening before, it was before Paul and published his book, like six years ago, a lot more newcomers started coming to plant talks and trying to come into ceremony. And uh, I found that the tone of the ceremonies were changing. So rather than a single facilitator like me sitting with maybe six people who had you generally would have experience and would have been pretty well curated, we started getting a lot more just newcomers coming in. I heard about this. Can I come sit? Right. And I was trying to manage that. The groups are getting bigger. So I immediately was moving to having a, like a hospitality manager and a second facilitator to sit with me. And then I was getting up to like 15 people sitting with uh, kind of three support staff. Um, and, uh, but the, the demand has been so high that I realized I kind of needed to slow everything down and just start training facilitators. So about uh, because I kept everybody kept trying to get me to sit for 30 people and you know all this right and uh, and so we've just been training facilitators Gen what I what I really love for sacred garden community is no more than eight uh, uh, practitioners in the ceremony and that would be with two facilitators preferably of of, of genders that are apt you know for the group right um and uh yeah, that's the kind of short uh, when we're doing training sometimes there might be three or four facilitators because they'll be doing practicum and that that's something i should mention we have uh, we have a uh, sort of a similar you know kind of a a uh, like an 80 hour curriculum for training but the practicum is what's really important for the for because that's where we really learn whether or not we're ready to do facilitation and that's a really subtle thing just because you've, you checked all the boxes and read the books and did the the, the exercises that that is not sufficient um, for, for really holding space in sacred garden community. I hope that's answering. The, the above ground actually worked really well for us right about the time that COVID came out was when we needed to do a lot of, to be blunt, hard work like creating bylaws, uh, training uh, folks about what, actually having conversations with community about what we are and how we're going to do this. And so we had Zoom meetings just like this. You know, we'd have like 30 people on the Zoom meeting, maybe 40. We would go through the bylaws. Part of, the, uh, of that was really profound where we would use words like church, religion, sacrament, liturgy. That's how we define our ceremonies as liturgies. And, um, and people would be naturally kind of really upset by those words. And so then we got to talk about like re corruption and retrieval. You know, like is it, is, is, is it, because there's a bad parent, does that mean that parents are bad, right? It's like, because there is corruption within a church, that may not be the meaning of church. So, you know, we had that exercise, which, which was also really lovely. Um, it's been a struggle. Uh, we, we, we did lose one of our elders around the COVID uh, politics, you know, that, that person was really upset that we, that we were following local health ordinances. And, and so that's been difficult, but we, we, we've been able to move through that as a community, just trying to look at your questions. Um, I have been hearing some concerns, but I think I, I'm, I'm concerned maybe that some of that is maybe hearsay. So I'm not really sure around the concerns part of your question. Essentially, what I'm hearing with uh, apologies for repeating hearsay 
is that you know this is kind of a corrupt group that is only really interested in supporting a certain kind of psychotherapeutic model that's very specific to some of the founding interests. That's just, I'm not expressing that concern. That's a concern that I'm hearing expressed, right? Um, and that, uh, of course, there's also concerns around access and, and capital and that sort of thing. But I'm mostly interested uh, and less expressing any, con any explicit concern here and, and, and just kind of trying to share what, what we would need, which was, is to be able to practice our religion without burden and, that, and to be open to transparency. Yeah. Hope that's useful. Kind of long-winded maybe. <laughs> very, very helpful. Thank you, I appreciate it. And this is Anne-Marie. Just to do a little bit of a time check, we have maybe eight minutes left before our second presenter. Um, does anyone else from the board or subcommittee? Go ahead, Kim. Yeah, it sounds like you have um, a, a ratio of, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not remembering your words. I mean, I'm, I'm more comfortable with the words that we've been using, a facilitator to client ratio of one to four. I'm wondering if you have any guidance about, I mean, how how big could a group get and be and be safe and manageable in your estimation? This is a fantastic question. Thank you. And and it's it's richer, I think, than the surface of the question because the question to me goes quickly to who is in the group that you're sitting with, right? So if you're sitting with newcomers who have had no experience or if you're sitting with folks who have expressed recent and strong trauma or folks who have expressed uh, you know, something that's intense like depression, you, you get my point. If you're yeah. sitting with someone who is a, a high touch, not, not meaning touch, but you wanna have a facilitator really be present for that person that you need to be there. It's their first experience. They don't, you know, you're going to be there for them. Then, I, then sometimes for some, actually, really, th there might that might be a two to one ratio, right? And I will make referrals to our trained facilitators to do one on ones or two on one for someone who's having lots of trauma or they're brand new or they, they just are feeling scared about sitting, you know, all that. If you have an experienced group with experienced practitioners who may be seeking deeper connection, they may be seeking deeper insight, they may be seeking guidance, whatever that, whatever that may be, creativity, you know, ludic uh, experience, whatever that may be, then you, then I feel that it can be, but you need to know those practitioners. Safe to have two facilitators with, or one facilitator with ten people, you know, or two facilitators with. 15 people, if the, all of those practitioners are experienced, I've sat with every one of them, you know, 10 or 15 times. I know them, they know me. We may go uh, uh, up to Wright's Beach where it's very beautiful and have a, a what we call a technical practice. You see that, you see the difference there? Yeah, mm -hmm. so, the, so I think that the ratio does depend on who you're sitting with. And that, that's why you need to take that to yeah. Just really quickly, do you feel like that's the type of thing that could be that is that included in your training programs? If somebody goes through your training program and your um, uh, practicum, they get a sense of of how to make those choices as a facilitator. And and yes, and it's really interesting because we find some facilitators are very suited for new practitioners. Some facilitators are are very suited for trauma work. Some facilitators are very experienced and they may really be able to help people connect into these divine spaces or or other spaces they may be more the facilitator may learn that they're suited for an experienced practitioner right so there's diversity on the facilitation side and then similarly that's why we want to take that time in community because the the, the practitioners and the facilitators get to know have to get to know each other and you, you find whether or not there's an affinity a sense of trust needs to grow and then you, you'll, you'll find those uh, that. But that's a big part of the, of the practicum. And often with the practicum, sometimes we'll find, you know, you're really gonna be great to do co-facilitation for, for a year or two before you even move into it. Someone else might say, you know what, you can be teaching me and you, and you're, you, know, you, can, you can hold a technical practice with experienced folks or beginners like that, yeah. So this is Anne-Marie for the record. Rebecca Martinez, are you here as the liaison for the sub-equity committee? Hi, this is Rebecca. Um, informally, yes, but formally, no. 
Great. Well, you can, I think um, since I'm not serving as a liaison, you can serve as the liaison today. Uh, did you have a question for Bob before we moved on? I do. Yeah. Just... Right Hi, Bob. Wonderful to Hi, see Rebecca. you. Always a pleasure. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak to, um, in your experience, sort of the, the benefits and values of ongoing practice. You, you started to talk in your last answer about, you know, folks who, who you had sat with 10 or 15 times. And I think that's something we haven't talked about a lot on these committees, which is um, sort of the differences and the potential benefits of instead of one mega dose that, you know, and understanding the costs involved, but really helping clients or practitioners who come in think about this as as a lifelong path and and the learnings are going to be continuous and maybe sometimes subtle and sometimes really big. I guess my question is, uh, what do you think is possible in Oregon if we if we really start to give some attention to maybe group practice and ongoing practice um, on one hand around the cost cost, you know, savings or stretching things out over multiple sessions over many months and years? Um, would just love to hear any reflections you have or things for us to think about. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's that's a great question and nice hearing your voice, Rebecca. Um, so there's also someone who's up in Portland, Karin Gagnon. Some of you may know her, uh, Karin, K-A-R-I-N. I, I don't think she would mind me sh sharing. She's in the PMHA group. She has a really lovely uh, insight into longitudinal practice, what will happen over time, right? And, and I think that this is something very important that we really miss. And th there are these things that you can sort of experience that often will happen. So you could, I'm not gonna do it, but you know, you can almost draw a little line of sort of levels of integration and different experiences that can move across time. So often right after a strong practice, there can be this extreme sense of joyous uh, breakthrough that can be sort of that positive life transforming. You want to go tell everybody and all of those things will often happen after the first one or two journeys that can lead to inflation, which can be really challenging for, for family members and friends and, and people who are on the other side of policy disputes or whatever it may be. Um, and then uh, that can then move into a really a, a sort of a trough of despair that can go on for a couple of years after. So, you know, the Johns Hopkins studies are great, but you, know, you need to kind of see what happens over time. And that's where also having supporting community can be extremely helpful. So that when you're moving through a process that may take six months, a year, two years, three years, five years or more, you, you can realize that you're not alone in that. So you're kind of like, I thought I, I thought I was healed. I thought I had like moved through all of my trauma. I was in the presence of God. But now suddenly all that anger and hatred, it's come back again, you know, things like that can happen, right? And so to have a healthy community to be a part of, um, can then somebody's like, yeah, I know that that's the way that this can be and we can move through this. So having that kind of support to move through those, th that transformation that will occur over time is, is helpful and doing work over time as is, as particularly a lot of some of the ayahuasca communities will recognize can also be very important people will realize, and this is a blessing of being a facilitator with a group that persists, that there are issues that we move through that, that we don't move through in one journey. It may be two, it may be three, it may be five. And, and sometimes people can even get stuck you know, into an area. And that's when I might also move to a different sacrament. You know, It's like, I've been doing this mushroom work and I just keep going back to, I, I just can't Get, forgive my my family member or whatever that may be so um to con but then moving through a different sacrament can really sometimes help a breakthrough uh, on that so to imagine that a single or two or three sort of therapeutic doses is is going to cause a sort of panacea cure i think is uh is probably not helpful another thing about cost if you can often a newcomer will want to sit a small one-on-one, -on -one, get your sea legs, get confident, do some initiatory practice. Sitting in groups is also a way of reducing cost. I'll just mention, you know, that can help bring the, the per uh, person cost down and the facilitator can still have a sustainable revenue. Um, so that that's a, a, a side benefit of, of group work can be reducing cost. But I think you want to have those uh, small opportunities because not everyone is definitely not ready to sit in a group. So you need to have both opportunity, both resources there. Yeah. 
Thank you, Rebecca. This is Anne Marie for the record. Um, thank you so much, Bob. Um, this was really wonderful. We really appreciated the uh, presentation and the discussion. Um, and thank you for joining in. Um, we are going to hear from John Dennis next. Uh, I am, he has a presentation on um, kind of regulation and the spiritual use of psilocybin therapy. Um, I would just like to remind folks that when you um, start your comments or start talking to state your name for the record uh, for the transcripts and uh, welcome John, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Anne-Marie, and it's really uh, great to be here with you all today. Um, Got a PowerPoint presentation. I'm not sure the best way to get that um, kind of moving. Is there, um, I don't know if either do a screen share or somebody else wants to kind of toggle with that. This is Anne-Marie. Jesse, did you, were you able to give John the ability to share his screen on that? I think you do have that permission, John. Have you tried the screen share button? I, oh. how's that? Can you we see? Can like it's it. working. Let's see here. All right, so can you all see that? This is Anne-Marie, yep, we can see it. Thank you, John. Great. So thank you all. Uh, it's a real honor to be here uh, with you all today um, and to talk about this matter that is, I think, of uh, paramount importance uh, with the remaining work that is left to do concerning the regulations that need to be drafted uh, before this program starts um, and starts very soon. Um, so this uh, project kind of began um, during one of the subcommittee meetings where I believe it was Mason asked, you know, what, what kinds of uh, protections do religious practitioners actually need? Um, and, and I wasn't, you know, and I, and I thought, well, surely somebody must know <laughs> um, how, to, how to kind of frame this in a regulatory uh, manner. Um, and part of the challenge, I think, of this project is that um, Oregon uh, is going to be the first, uh, to my knowledge, uh, government in that in existence um, of, of like a you know a, a normal like non uh, kind of indigenous uh, type of government uh, that has kind of come up with a regulatory framework in which to um, kind of govern uh, religious practice. So um, I started thinking about it, and I've come up with what I believe um, after seeking some stakeholder input. Um, is a way to uh, provide kind of uh, appropriate flexibility for people uh, that are taking uh, psilocybin within the context of Measure 109 for religious uh, purposes. So, um, so when we talk about uh, Measure 109, there's a lot of talk about whether uh, you know, it's therapy or non-therapy. And um, I, I don't know if that uh, conversation is particularly helpful um, because therapy could mean a lot of different things. And I, I think it's really critical that we interpret Measure 109 within the broader context uh, of the war on drugs, uh, which has resulted in a lot of misinformation uh, being spread. Um, and um, you know, as we are trying to consider um, ways that this can be done uh, safely, um, I, I start from the assumption that it is uh, always better uh, and safer for a person to take uh, psilocybin within Measure 109 than it is for them to take it outside of Measure 109. And so from just a pure harm reduction perspective, uh, it behooves the state of Oregon and the people of Oregon to try to invite as much use uh, of psilocybin that currently exists into the safe container uh, of Measure 109. And we should say, um, that it, is it safe or is it safer? Uh, well, a lot of people engage in a lot of uh, activities that carry inherent risk. And I think it's important when we consider how to regulate uh, psilocybin under Measure 109 uh, to keep in mind that there's all kinds of risky activities that people engage in on a regular basis, things uh, like skydiving and, um, you know, uh, driving and, you know, alcohol and nicotine. Um, and you know, it's 
it's not the same thing for Oregon to say to somebody, uh, you know, we think you should do this versus uh, you're an adult, you're going to make your own decisions, and we're going to try to provide a, a safe or safer uh, way to do it and make sure that you really kind of have some certain disclosures and information before you uh, proceed to, uh, to make those decisions. So um, I think that's kind of the conceptual framework that I uh, begin from when I think about this. And so when we think about what religious use of psilocybin looks like um, and just kind of psychedelic religions uh, more broadly, um, I think it, I, I kind of identify three sort of main categories of uh, psychedelic religions. And um, we have kind of the traditional established, uh, you know, indigenous uh, practice. Um, you know, we have um, kind of a, a, a new branch uh, of a religion that, that has kind of a psychedelic twist, as I like to refer to it. And then we have wholly new traditions that don't necessarily have uh, long histories, um, but that are still, um, you know, in terms of the federal jurisprudence that exists, um, you know, the federal jurisprudence doesn't really make any distinction between how old a religion uh, is, because as, uh, you know, religions and religious movements are uh, kind of springing up uh, all the time, and that doesn't mean that they're not like a valid uh, religious uh, tradition. Uh, so we see a, a wide variety. Um, uh, there's an organization called Institute for the Advancement of Psychedelic Christianity, um, and, you know, we see um, kind of traditional Christian, uh, you know, psychedelic religions uh, or psychedelic religious movements within Christianity. Um, we see uh, the same with uh, Judaism. Uh, that's kind of a, a new, uh, you know, and big, that's one of the, the more kind of predominant threads in, in modern psychedelic, uh, kind of contemporary psychedelic religions. Um, and then, you know, we have, uh, you know, Christian and Judaism. This is a really great uh, episode of Psychedelics Today that just came out uh, with a couple of, um, you know, a clergymen who are talking about um, kind of how their faith tradition intersects with uh, psychedelics. And, um, you know, this book recently has uh, generated a whole lot of interest. I, I, the Immortality Key by Brian Morescu. Uh, kind of with this idea that many religions uh, may have had their root within a, uh, you know, either like a, we know that most religions have their 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 impetus or their origin within, uh, you know, spiritual experience or revelation. Uh, and as, you know, psychedelics generally uh, are catalysts for uh, revelation or, or the experience of, of, of that. Um, you know, there's there's kind of a new emerging attempt to to kind of cite uh, existing religious traditions with a with a, a different origin, and this is only growing as time goes on. This is becoming a bigger and bigger uh, segment of of the of the kind of of the psychedelic kind of space. Um, you know, Chikruna uh, does amazing work. They're probably one of the the best organizations that promotes. Um, kind of this type of uh, approach to psychedelics. And, and uh, you know, and, and John Allegro uh, is another interesting sort of um, uh, character. He was a kind of a legendary Dead Sea Scroll scholar who uh, <laughs> published this book and kind of lost his uh, academic uh, credential or his, uh, his, his reputation as a, as a, as a impeccable uh, researcher on, on uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so I offer these just as an attempt to, 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 to see what, what this might actually look like um, for religious practice under Measure 109, because this could be uh, something very much in a, uh, that looks more like uh, an indigenous practice or a, a neo-shamanic type of practice, or it could look something very traditional. Um, uh, in terms of uh, the more traditional practices, our own uh, research subcommittee during its uh, rapid evidence review identified a large number of indigenous tribes that have a long uh, documented history uh, using um, you know psilocybin mushrooms in particular um, and you know th these date back obviously many many years um, and you know in the in the Central American uh, you know and, and I think northern south northern part of South America kind of uh, geographical location, 
Um, but there's talk that it could be much uh, longer standing than that and much more widespread. Um, this is kind of the, the famous uh, Tassili Niger cave art, uh, in North, Southern Algeria that dates back to, you know, probably 12,000 years as I believe the, the best uh, guess at the date. And on the, the picture on the left, we have cave art showing, you know, this kind of uh, kind of figure that has mushrooms kind of, you know, coming out of, of, of them and, you know, people. Um, and on the right, we have this uh, modern interpretation or modern kind of reimagining of, of this that, that, you know, is, is kind of growing in, uh, you know, popularity and this sort of thing. And, uh, you know, this is just sort of the kind of cultural trends that are emerging, uh, you know, like right now, is is kind of recognizing, kind of creating this current type of mythology and ter and uh, that that I think will will certainly uh, find uh, expression in Oregon's program. Um, and of course, we have these uh, you know pre-Columbian mushroom stones uh, that you know uh, seem to be uh, you know many believe that they were inspired by uh, you know tribal uh, you know indigenous. Uh, practice involving mushrooms. Um, so, you know, and of course, uh, when we talk about psilocybin, we, you know, in the indigenous history of it, uh, you know, we have to, of course, uh, you know, M Maria Sabina is the person to who we owe credit for uh, knowing about them uh, today. Um, you know, she was a Mazatec, uh, you know, medicine woman um, who through her um, gracious uh, welcoming in, of Gordon, uh, R. Gordon Wasson into uh, her community, uh, you know, kind of was the was the the connection where it became uh, known in the Western world, um, and his, you know, rather uh, irreverent uh, appearing uh, Life magazine article uh, is you know dating to 1957 is kind of when. Um, the, the so-called Western world really uh, started to become aware uh, of that. So, you know, within the modern uh, context, uh, I, I saw on the on the call here on today's meeting, we actually may have somebody uh, from Sanctuary. Uh, but when we're looking at modern contemporary, you know, psychedelic religions that use psilocybin above ground um, to try to further identify what sacred practice under Measure 109 really looks like. Um, you know, I can identify basically three uh, different churches that that practice openly and above ground, and, uh, and I guess we we you know say number four if we if we add the uh, Sacred Garden community into that. Thank you, Bob, for your great presentation today. Um, and so, you know, there's not a whole lot that's known about a lot of these organizations, um, in part because they operate in a legal gray area. Um, we do have, you know, robust federal protections, uh, but we don't really have great local protections in, in most areas. And, and some, uh, the, the law of religious freedom with respect to psychedelics is kind of long and, and complicated, and it's beyond the scope of this presentation to do it full justice. But I just kind of want to give it a brief overview just to, to see what this might look like. Um, and then, of course, we have um, the... Okliuva, uh, I think is how you say it, a Native American church. Um, this is the, the church that um, Jeremy Mack uh, belonged to in the New Hampshire case that I've raised on a couple of occasions to the board, uh, in which a psilocybin uh, prosecution uh, was successfully defended based on a religious use defense um, for possession of uh, a small you know, amount of psilocybin. And they do have a branch uh, in Eugene that is not necessarily affiliated with the larger chapter, but um, this is the kind of thing that I think is inevitably uh, going to arise and, and, and find expression within Oregon. Um, so the hard part about this is that we don't really know the scope of, of uh, psychedelic religious practice um, in part because of its kind of gray area legality. Um, one interesting data point that we have is that in 2022, or sorry, 2020, um, a, a recent FOIA request that the Chacruda Institute uh, gave uh, discovered that there was 966 ayahuasca seizures uh, by customs. Uh, 
And that's believed to be a, a relatively small amount of the total of ayahuasca that came into the country, uh, you know, and that was done. So um, this, this really could be a lot bigger than anybody currently realizes. Uh, and uh, part of this is I will be um, kind of sending out a survey uh, soon to kind of better understand the scope of, of contemporary practice. Um, particularly on psilocybin, where there's just not a lot of data, uh, in part because of prohibition. So um, I had hoped to have this survey uh, and the data available at this presentation, but I had an abundance of respect for the Oregon Health Authority uh, and their survey that they have currently circulating. Uh, I made the decision to kind of delay uh, circulating it um, so that there not be confusion about, you know, which survey is the official state surveys, but um, I will be reporting back to this during uh, probably a public comment session um, to, to give you all the data that we find out uh, from this, um, from this effort. Um, so this is a lot of words, <laughs> um, but the, the, the nexus between a psychedelic um, experience and a religious experience uh, is borne out by the scientific literature. Um, and these are a couple of things I wanted to highlight. Um, it seems, according to the data, and of course, this is a relatively recent uh, field of study, so a lot still remains to be learned about the exact mechanisms that these things operate with. Uh, but the um, it seems like the intensity of my the mystical experience, they have these mystical experience questionnaires and things like that. And what they've, what the data show is that the, the more intense of a mystical experience, the better uh, the health outcome uh, of, the, of the participant. And so it's kind of a, a new type of mystical or spiritual uh, healing that doesn't necessarily really fit well into the traditional therapeutic model. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the, the study in the middle there with uh, Roland Griffiths, uh, after 14 months, they determined that uh, a large number, and this is over a year later, keep in mind, that a large number of the uh, participants dis described their uh, psilocybin experience as being one of the top five most spiritually significant experiences of their entire lives. Um, and... Uh, it's right up there with the, with the death of the parent or the birth of a child. I mean, we're talking about uh, things that are just of, of the most uh, important kind of moments of a person's life uh, can happen on psilocybin. Um, and the last article there is from the team at Imperial College of London that shows that there have been significant shifts uh, in people's metaphysical views uh, that are occasioned by psilocybin. So I think as, as kind of this psychedelic renaissance unfolds, we're only going to see uh, more and more kind of of these uh, churches and, and these religious institutions that embrace psychedelics as a pathway to um, have these um, encounters with the divinity um, grow more and more over time. Um, so, you know, the question is, um, when we're talking about Measure 109 and trying to find the container for psychedelic healing, uh, what is the best model for that? And what's the best container for it? And um, you know, the therapy piece is, is a relatively recent experience. I don't think um, outside of uh, the use of psychedelics, there's been, uh, you know, typically people don't think about outside of psychedelic therapy, going into their therapist's office to have spiritual experiences. Um, they typically think of those as being cited uh, within a religious community. And I think, you know, it, and there's different things for different people, but I just kind of want to really anchor this. Um, if, if the mechanism of, of, of psychedelic healing uh, is largely spiritual in nature, it only kind of makes sense on a certain level that it be housed in a, in a, in a more of a, a spiritual container or a religious container. Uh, rather than therapeutic. And it's not that there's only room for one, I think there's room for all, but I just really want to kind of emphasize that, uh, that part of it. Um, so luckily, um, when we're thinking about how Oregon can regulate this, um, there's a lot of this talk that, you know, because Oregon's the first state to ever have anything like this, um, th there's a lot of 
reinventing the wheel or, you know, not even reinventing it, but just inventing it because um, there's not a program uh, anywhere that really does this on the kind of scale uh, that Oregon's now looking. Um, and fortunately, um, we don't have to reinvent the wheel uh, within the context of psychedelic uh, religious practice. Um, there's already been extensive legal history and litigation around uh, to, to determine what, what is the appropriate uh, like scope of, of rights of a, of, a, of a religious practitioner who uses uh, some kind of psychedelic or plant medicine as a, either, a, either as a sacrament or as an adjunct to their uh, religious practice. And of course, we're not going to be able to do justice to this in the short time that we have today. Um, but essentially, what I wanted to emphasize here is that Oregon has a, a, a pretty unique and interesting history in this, considering now uh, we tend to be at the very forefront of drug policy, uh, really in the world, but certainly in the United States. Um, but this case, Oregon v. Smith, um, is kind of one of the more regressive uh, pieces of Oregon drug policy that we've ever uh, kind of had. Um, so essentially the case Oregon v. Smith was about uh, two uh, drug treatment counselors who were Native Americans and belonged to the Native American church. Uh, their their su superiors at their, uh, at their work found out that they were, um, you know, taking peyote for religious purposes and fired them. And that case went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And at the U.S. Supreme Court, it was decided um, that a state really has the right to uh, discriminate uh, against a person and prohibit um, use of, of plant sacraments as, uh, as in religious practice. So um, that case, Oregon v. Smith, uh, sparked kind of a national revolt, um, which resulted just three years later in 1993 uh, with the passage of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Um, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act is kind of the predominant law that, um, that most of these cases throughout uh, the United States uh, are litigated under. Um, when a psychedelic church, uh, a church that uses a psychedelic uh, as a sacrament, um, you know, is trying to get its, its rights recognized and established. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention with this is that um, it's been used, you know, successfully with the UDV case uh, all the way up to the US Supreme Court. It's been litigated here in Oregon um, with the Santo Daime Church. Um, this case, City of Born, um, stands for the proposition that when the um, when RIFRA was passed, it was intended that it would uh, apply and bind all of the states. And it was intended to do that to prevent a, 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 a situation like Oregon v. Smith from ever happening in anywhere in the United States ever again. And um, in this you know, tense political climate. It, it was even tense, if you can believe it, back in uh, 1993 during the Clinton administration. Uh, but it it passed with such a, a, a strong, uh, unanimous support that it's it's really hard to to, to think about this um, as being kind of an open question at this point in our nation's history. Um, it passed Senate 97 to three. Uh, passed the House unanimous, unanimously, I should mention even Oregon's two senators, uh, despite the fact that this was uh, their, their case, that this was their state law that was essentially uh, being challenged, um, the two Oregon senators at the time uh, voted uh, in favor of, of basically overturning the Oregon v. Smith decision by passing RIFRA. Um, now, the RIFRA, um, like I said earlier, it was intended to apply to the states, but it really um, it, it was overturned uh, by the by the U.S. Supreme Court in that case I cited earlier, the Flores case. Um, so it's it's still binding at the federal level, but it's not binding at the state level. Um, so so Oregon, you know, is because of that. That's why we're having this conversation because if that hadn't been the case, um, Oregon would have no choice but to but to allow broad. Uh, religious practice, but since uh, we don't have that, you know, the, the, the challenge now before Oregon is to, you know, craft religious use protections uh, under a regulatory system. Um, so uh, when we we're looking at this, um, just, and I guess just to put the, the strength of what RIFRA actually says, is that a, a law of general applicability 
um, which means a law that is not facially discriminatory. It means a law that um, is written neutrally that would apply uh, to, to anybody. Um, it can't be uh, you know, enforced against a religious practitioner unless it furthers a compelling, like a really, really strong government interest and that there's really not a another way of, of ensuring uh, that interest. Um, so to put it in the layperson's terms, it just means that the government must be extremely careful uh, when, when regulating religious practice. And that was the broad, near unanimous, unanimous in the House, almost in the Senate, um, consensus that we as a nation had reached when we passed RIFRA. And it turned out after the fact that uh, it, it wasn't binding on the states, but that was uh, the, na the nation's uh, clear and unequivocal intent um, at the time. So um, with that, we get to uh, my proposed framework, um, which I, I believe you all have uh, probably had now. Um, and so the, the model that, so the, let me just say a few words about this. Um, the idea of this is to come up with a model that will grant as close to the full uh, scale and scope of religious protections uh, that's available under Measure 109 um, with the knowledge that, um, that, 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 that these are coming from a regulatory system instead of from a federal law or a different uh, source, legal, legal source. Um, and so the inspiration for this comes from uh, several different places. Um, it just kind of as a, as a person in my background with a degree in religious studies, and I've spent significant time, uh, you know, exploring those on, a, on an academic uh, level, as well as as a personal level. Um, you know, there's that. And then um, the Santo Daime model here in Oregon, I, I, I believe provides a really interesting and effective model uh, for, for a peer support uh, that, that can, might be able to reduce uh, the facilitator to client ratio so that we start to actually get at an affordable program uh, that doesn't leave lots of people uh, out, out of the service center. That uh, if a person wants to take it, I, I believe uh, the Santo Daime uh, kind of practice uh, has, has a lot of wisdom to bear on this. And um, on my most recent uh, episode of Eyes on Oregon, the Psychedelics Today podcast that I co-host, um, I interviewed Jonathan Goldman, their spiritual leader, uh, kind of about this. So if people are interested or concerned even about what peer support within the context of Measure 109 it looks like, I would encourage people to go check out that episode uh, because they can hear it straight from uh, Jonathan Goldman um, and, and have that. Um, I, I did seek substantial stakeholder input, and I did receive st substantial stakeholder input into this model. Um, however, because of prohibition and because of the kind of legal gray area, and, and also just this is kind of a hot, uh, hot topic that is controversial, um, the vast, vast majority of people who weighed in uh, wish to remain anonymous. Uh, so I, 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 it, I wish I could give more specific details about the individuals who helped kind of inform this, but out of respect to them and their privacy, uh, and out of you know concern for their uh, the potential consequences that could come from them being um, disclosed, it's hard to do that. Um, but um, but th that but I but there was an, uh, an effort and, and significant input was uh, received. Um, there's also this process that some of you may know about through the DEA, where uh, a, a, an individual uh, church can a, a petition the DEA for a religious exemption to the Controlled Substances Act. Um, in the, I believe that process started after the UDV litigation at the US Supreme Court in 2006. Um, and it is my understanding uh, that um, in all of the years since 2006 and all of the many applications that have been uh, filed to the DEA, they've never once actually granted an exemption. Um, and so many of us who are observing this process believe that to be uh, kind of performed in bad faith on their part, but the actual idea of a, of a application process uh, isn't inherently bad and it actually provides a good model if it can be done um, with, with integrity and can be done um, 
kind of fairly. Um, so uh, there we the model actually does borrow a little bit from that. Um, it borrows from Oregon's own peyote statute. So Oregon, uh, as some of you may know, is one of the six states in the country that has a peyote protection statute that is not limited uh, just to Native Americans. Uh, you don't, there's no uh, racial or uh, ethnic, ethnic uh, kind of requirement in order to take peyote uh, safely, legally uh, under in, in Oregon. And it's one of the few states that actually has that. So we borrowed some language from the peyote uh, the religious protections we already give to uh, peyote practitioners. And then finally, um, you know, Maria Sabina, uh, I like to think of it as if Maria Sabina were alive today and wanted to come and, and conduct ceremony in Oregon, uh, are we going to allow Maria Sabina to do her thing in Oregon? And if, if yes, then how, um, what can we do to keep that affordable and accessible to uh, people of ordinary uh, financial means? So um, when we define what religious practice might look like under Measure 109, we, are, we start with this list of what I call non-negotiables. So Measure 109 has a number of things that are firmly etched into it that may not be um, negotiated. Um, and those are things like the, there's obviously a facilitator that has to be there and you can't take psilocybin. Uh, facilitation has to be non-directive. Uh, the psilocybin uh, has to be consumed and experienced and purchased at a facility. Um, there's no outdoor cultivation. Um, I appreciate uh, Bob's comments earlier about multi-sacraments. And um, unfortunately, I don't necessarily believe that the measure uh, really provides a legal pathway uh, for that. But um, so that's like kind of a, a, a another assumption of this, uh, this framework. Um, you know, psilocybin has to be sold. It can't be gifted or, um, you know, and that's actually where it's taxed for the state is at the, at the product level. Um, and then, you know, these mandatory client information forms. So there's all these things that are, are basically non-negotiable. They're, they're there. And no matter uh, what a person's religious convictions would say there's there's if if the if the legal ability or right to, to do this comes from from the state itself, um, there's really no way around this currently without a legislative change, um, which isn't really on the table here. So this is trying to set the parameters for how we could do this um, under the measure, uh, and it's it's worth saying, and this is a really important point that. Um, with the state of things at the federal level currently, if Oregon were to allow the broadest possible uh, kind of leeway to religious practitioners and a religious that, that's possibly allowed under the measure, um, that even still there would not be, that would be less religious freedom than what is already available at the federal level. If Oregon does the most that it can possibly do, that's less than what's already there federally. Um, just to put this in, in just really plain, uh, clear terms. Um, so so that's, that's kind of a, a major uh, sticking point. Um, so un if that's the case, then why would a religious practitioner ever wanna operate under Measure 109 if they're giving something up in order to, to practice? And uh, the reasons for that are, are, are fairly simple, um, you know, there's not really good options right now in light of this kind of legal gray area where they operate. Um, the only current ways for a religious practitioner to practice is either they do it underground and that carries a bunch of uh, kind of issues because as we've, uh, for those of you who've been following uh, the, the podcast that's, been, uh, that's being released between uh, Symposia and New York Magazine called Cover Story, uh, they're doing a great job of kind of explaining uh, how underground practices really has some inherent problems. Um, so underground practice is, you know, and then there's still the chance that uh, law enforcement can show up, even though it is in this legal gray area. And um, under the state law, it, it may not even be that gray. So, um, so underground practice has its issues. Uh, you can petition the DEA. Like I said earlier, the DEA has never approved uh, a practice. I've actually submitted a FOIA request to the DEA to get more information about uh, who's, who's done this, uh, like who's petitioned and what the results are. 
Uh, that was uh, almost a year ago now, and they were claiming the pandemic makes it impossible for them to respond. But uh, you know, we'll we'll see what they come back with. Um, you can sue the federal government, like uh, like the Santo Daime Church did, like the UDV Church did, uh, like the Soulquest Church in Florida uh, is doing currently, um, to try to get some kind of uh, acknowledgement that their practices are legal, um, and. Um, you know, or you can go to another country. So there's really not like uh, a lot of options. Um, so in terms of, we talked about the non-negotiables and we talk about what's negotiable and there's a lot of things that are possible. Okay. John, I just wanna give you a quick time check um, that you have a little over five minutes left and then we'll open up for questions uh, so that we leave time for public comment at the end. Sorry to interrupt you, go ahead. No, thank you. I really appreciate that, Emery. Um, so I'll kind of try to cut to the chase. Um, if Oregon gives less liberty to religious practitioners than is available under Measure 109, uh, it would really constitute a significant setback into the progress uh, that has been a far hard fought and won across uh, multiple practitioners throughout the country. Uh, it's taken years and millions of dollars in legal fees to get to where we are. Uh, and, and that's, so there is this, this piece that as Oregon is figuring this out, it's really uh, critical that it not kind of curtail um, religious freedom uh, for, for essentially a, as part of the Oregon model that we expect will be exported to other states that follow uh, Oregon's lead. So um, I have an article that's about ready to come out through psychedelics today. I think it actually just hit today. That kind of goes through some of this since I'm going to run out of time, it looks like. But there's a number of uh, individual considerations that I think are really important uh, for the state to consider when it decides how to treat religious activity under the measure. Um, and, you know, I think one of these is that um, Oregon Constitution protects the religious and the irreligious alike. So rather than like phrasing this in terms of religious practice, we have to consider it such that if there were a non-religious practitioner that wanted to still uh, have a spiritual uh, center um, that didn't necessarily require any set of you know, beliefs that typically we identify as religious, uh, that it would have to be equally open and available to them. And that's why the verbiage throughout the proposed um, you know, regulatory framework that I've dra drafted uh, uses the term entheogenic rather than religious. It's probably is a little bit more specific. Um, and uh, <clears throat> here's the peyote statute, and um, I'll, I'll try to get right to the uh, point here. Uh, Maria Sabina, again, going back to her, uh, the, the place where, you know, magic mushrooms, so-called, got their start in the West, um, resulted in a lot of havoc and a lot of, uh, a lot of bad things happened to her and her community as a result of uh, our Gordon Wasson and um, his involvement. Uh, he had promised her uh, that he wouldn't take published pictures and he wouldn't disclose her name. And of course he did that right away. Uh, he made about $60,000 uh, off of it and, uh, and caused this whole uh, circus of people, including John Lennon and Bob Dylan and other people to start coming to this rural village in, in a mountainous region of Mexico. Um, and it even resulted in uh, like the government starting to impose like the, the Oaxacan uh, government or the Mexican government starting to impose restrictions on psilocybin practice. And this is just such a heartbreaking piece of the story uh, that she said uh, later uh, that from the moment the foreigners arrived, the holy children, which, which is what she called uh, mushrooms, lost their purity. Uh, they lost their force. They, meaning the foreigners, had ruined them and they'll no longer work and there's no remedy for it. So when we think about um, kind of what we as Oregon it, are, are, are doing right now with this new Measure 109 and this whole new, uh, you know, psilocybin, you know, psychedelic kind of uh, uh, program, um, we have to consider this history. Uh, and part of this history is the emergence of this thing called the Psychedelics Industrial Complex. Um, this is the list right now of companies that are publicly traded. Um, uh, and this is just, and keep in mind with this, uh, about $4.8 billion of market cap, uh, none of this is even really legal yet. <laughs> um, 
And we are already seeing uh, some of the more, and I, and I want to make it clear that I don't suppose that all of these companies that are on this list are, you know, engaging in, in these really kind of aggressive tactics, but we are starting to already see uh, the intellectual property grabs, the land grabs, trying to corner out other uh, types of, of access to psychedelic healing modalities uh, that exist. So what this is getting at is um, if we as a society are to protect religious use, the best way to do that is to do it now, uh, because as these companies get bigger and bigger and bigger and become more and more aggressive and try to corner out other uh, types of, of psychedelic um, healing and, and psychedelic use, um, it, you know, right now, it, it, it's, it's not going to get easier as this industrial complex gets bigger and more and more entrenched. So um, in closing, uh, what I am proposing here is a sort of partnership between uh, the Oregon Health Authority uh, and entheogenic practitioners, religious practitioners, that I believe would be mutually beneficial to all parties involved um, by bringing entheogenic practice out of the underground and above ground, uh, we provide uh, mechanisms of oversight and accountability uh, that will be good for everybody. Um, in, it, it, it ensures that clients are going to go through a screening process and that there's uh, just safeguards in place that, you know, people don't have to necessarily risk jail uh, for. And, um, and it just really helps also with the, the kind of tension that is inherent in Measure 109 of balancing uh, safety with uh, accessibility and affordability, um, I believe, uh, particularly with the peer support model and the home grow mushroom uh, model uh, that are part of this program that we can drive the price point down to something that's actually affordable. I think we can actually get it under $50, uh, but the key to this program working is that it has to be a nonprofit community, uh, religious or spiritual community that grows slowly and organically and naturally over time. Uh, and, and I just, you know, it's this, this case, this cause is too important to allow uh, it to, to, to be another uh, vehicle. If Oregon Measure 109 is another program that, that reinforces or deepens the inequities that exist along racial, health, financial uh, uh, mechanisms, it's, it's just going to be uh, such a tragic thing that as we kind of enter into this there's a new era where we reestablish relationships with plant medicines. Um, I think it's just critical that we give uh, small community-led organizations um, kind of their own means of production that doesn't require, um, we, that we just kind of do something to protect that. Um, and, I, and I think that with the safe mechanisms in place from the, the overall measure, um, I believe there is a safe uh, way to do that, that it can be affordable and not just another uh, mechanism to kind of deepen the social divides that we already um, kind of are rife with in, in the, these days as wealth becomes increasingly concentrated. So thank you so much. Well, this is Anne-Marie. Thank you so much, John Dennis. Sorry to have to kind of speed it up at the end. I just want to leave room for public comment at the end. But before that, um, I want to open it up. We're not at public comment yet. I apologize. Um, I want to open it up to board members um, and committee members who have questions for John with his presentation. Am I still screen sharing? No, you are not still screen sharing. <laughs> Go ahead, Kim. I think um, I, I really appreciated that presentation and I absolutely see the importance of these kinds of substances and religious use. I think the place where I'm getting stuck is, and you mentioned this, what we have in our hands is 109. And so as I'm thinking about 109, you know, what we have are the, the, the rules about groups. And so the concerns that I have about the religious use and how to help churches are the same questions I have about groups. Like what, what are we gonna do about very, very large groups? Or how will people be prepared appropriately or screened for maybe contraindications? And what's the availability of aftercare? If you have a large church, you might have a nice support system. If you have a very small church, what availability will there be to help people when they need it afterwards? 
That's a really great question. Um, so in the model framework that I've uh, presented, um, it, it addresses those uh, several ways. Um, first off, it requires that uh, people who come to a religious organization uh, have to go through the standard intake and screening procedures to make sure that those are all uh, there. Um, it, it, you know, it, it actually borrows that, and I think that it would actually help uh, the spiritual or religious communities uh, to, to have that in place. Um, so I think your, your concerns there are very well founded, and I agree with them 100%. So I, I'm not suggesting that we should do away with those uh, in religious use cases. Um, with respect to group settings, um, I, I like to keep in mind that these uh, licensees, be they service centers or facilitators or manufacturers, um, their licensure is on the line. And, um, it, you know, and in exchange for having these extra kind of what I've termed privileges under uh, this proposal, uh, there's also a set of duties that go with those. And the Oregon Health Authority will would uh, retain full uh, disciplinary authority and power uh, to punish uh, bad actors. And, um, and I think that given, and, and one thing that came through when I was talking with Jonathan Goldman, um, as a, you know, I don't, he's a sincere spiritual practitioner, religious practitioner, and he believes, as, as I think is right, that that the community will will probably in many ways be the best, um, will care more about its uh, congregants' well-being than, than even the Oregon Health Authority will uh, in most cases. And in the cases where um, they may overstep or may be, uh, you know, um, loose uh, with, with things, then they, they face sanctions and punishment and potentially loss of licensure. So it's, it's that kind of delicate balance that if they, they, they do all of this, I mean, if we give them a long leash to kind of uh, do things in a way that's consistent with their convictions and beliefs, um, it, then that comes with it, the responsibility to do it safely and knowing that there's, you know, complaint systems. And I actually, um, in my proposed uh, framework, require there to be disclosures on how to file complaints against uh, the church to uh, both the church and the Oregon Health Authority. So um, I, I think that concern is, is well taken as, as well, and I've tried to incorporate that into the, into the model. Suzanne Marie, wonderful. Thank you, John. Uh, Kim, do you have any follow-up questions, or do any other uh, board members or committee members have questions? You can just go right ahead. <laughs> yeah, thanks. This is Sarah President, um, local public health officer. I um, and unfortunately did not have time to read uh, the whole framework and digest it. So I'm, I'm still digesting and trying to um, trying to get a handle on what is within our control as far as recommendations that we make as a board uh, versus the, the legalities of it and not being a lawyer. I'm, I think there's, I'm still, I'm still struggling. Um, and my question is, uh, Anne-Marie, can we have those slides shared with us? I don't think that we got those as, as an attachment because uh, I think there's some things I'd like to continue to digest from those as well. Yeah, I'm sorry, I only sent those out like an hour ago. So, I, you know, I, I've been working on this until just a little bit ago. So um, I'm also happy to continue uh, this dialogue. Um, you know, I think you all know how to get my, my emails in the slide uh, show too. So if you have any questions and you want to kind of process or work through or raise concerns of things I might have overlooked, um, you know, I, I, my, my hope here is just to be as helpful as possible um, and to provide a, a flexible framework that can, that could, you know, be adapted or modified as needed to make sure that uh, if, 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 the, if either this committee, the overall board or the health authority wanted to strike the safety, freedom, you know, religious freedom balance uh, differently, there's a few uh, ways that I've uh, kind of worked into there so that they could, they could you know, reasonable minds can differ on some of this stuff, but um, but I, again, I emphasize that um, with the current state of protections federally, if Oregon does less than the most it can do, it is a significant setback um, to to this cause that have, many people have uh, spent a, a great amount of time and effort fighting for. Thank you. This is Anne Marie and um, Jesse. Um, are you the person that would be uh, the one to send out the slides to the subcommittee? I'm also happy to do it if that's if it should be me. Yeah, I'll I'll send those out to the subcommittee and uh, 
John, if you don't mind, uh, we'll also post them to the meeting date on the website. Yeah, that would be just fine. Wonderful. Are there are there any other questions from committee members, board members that are present? Okay, well, wonderful. Um, I just really want to thank our two presenters today. Um, it was really wonderful to hear from you both. Um, this was really powerful. So thank you, John Dennis. Uh, thank you to Bob Otis as well. Um, I think we all learned a lot. Um, and it was really great to get this information. Um, there's nothing for the board to or the subcommittee, sorry, to vote on today. Um, so if there aren't any other topics for discussion that board members have or questions that you want to pose, I think we can go ahead and open open it up for public comment. Um, and then Jesse, um, I'm not sure how Mason normally handles this. Are you the person that's going to call on folks uh, for public comment or is that me? Uh, each subcommittee chair handles this differently. I'm happy to moderate the uh, public comment if you would like me to do that. That would be great. Thank you, Jesse. Okay. I believe we may have somebody on the phone. Um, well, we have several people on the phone. Uh, if you were on the phone and you would like to make a public comment, you can press star nine and that will cause your hand to raise on our, our Zoom screen here. Um, so far, I only see Joshua Pritikins, and please forgive me if I've mispronounced your last name, um, but go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, this is Joshua Pritikin calling in from... Uh... Uh, Southern Oregon, and um, uh, I really enjoyed the the presentation today at the at this subcommittee. And uh, I think this is a really important topic and should should receive more attention. Um, but um, the the public comment um, I, I wanted to make is actually regarding the um, yesterday's equity subcommittee meeting, and uh, following up on the criminal background check question, which um, has also been uh, raised at this subcommittee. And um, uh, just to refresh everyone's memory, um, you know, I've, I've uh, commented a few times already, but the, the issue uh, foremost in my mind is that because of the drug war, um, people who uh, have been uh, caught with uh, you know, possession of controlled substances, um, uh, and because of how our criminal justice system works, that they've uh, often pled guilty or taken plea deals uh, for uh, criminal convictions that were in a totally different category from what, um, from you know, a straightforward uh, uh, you know, possession of a controlled substance um, kind of uh, category. And uh, and then the, the other thing to consider is that. Um, convictions may be from out of state and not in Oregon. And so that the, uh, the, the drug laws there um, could be slightly different than the, the drug laws in Oregon. So that, that um, my, my, my uh, concern is that the um, only looking at the category of conviction is, is really that information has been corrupted by the drug law, uh, the, the, the war on drugs, and that um, that uh, the, cat, the conviction categories um, may, you know, may or may not represent what actually happened. And um, so I would caution the health authority from relying on those categories to make decisions on the criminal background check. And so I had suggested um, a way of, of, of analyzing, of looking at the case discovery, but that may be too complicated. So one one other solution, and uh, there were um, like no nobody wanted to talk about this in the equity subcommittee. I guess no one had any ideas. So I'm trying to stir the pot, come up with other approaches for addressing this problem um, that, um, that that might be acceptable. And um, you know, one one approach would be just to disregard uh, misdemeanor convictions in general. You know, all all misdemeanor convictions and um, you know, I, I understand that, you know, o OHA is concerned about safety and doesn't want to uh, license, uh, you know, potentially um, problematic people for, for this program. But um, on the other hand, the, 
the crim the the record and the you know the um, criminal histories have been uh, you know the information there is not reliable. It's been corrupted by the war on drugs, and and I would caution the health authority from relying on that on those categories. So it's um, I you know I, um, it's a it's a difficult um, uh, it's a difficult puzzle to figure out, and um, I mean, it's and the reason I keep raising this is because it's uh, um, I'm personally affected by this. I I was um, in possession of a controlled substance in Virginia, and I pled guilty to a misdemeanor in a category that was totally unrelated to um, possessing uh, psilocybin. So it's it's a it's a personal concern for me, and I'm sure it is also a. Uh, a concern for many other people who maybe are not uh, courageous enough to uh, to raise uh, to raise this issue or their you know their personal story. So that that thank you for uh, hearing my public comment. Thank you, Joshua. Up next, uh, we've got Jyoti Ma, and we have about twelve minutes left, and uh, three people with hands raised. So if you can limit your comments everyone to uh, two or three minutes a piece. We'll be good on time. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I want to uh, say thank you to John Dennis for presenting so well on the concerns um, and solutions for religions. It's really important. There's a lot of spiritual practitioners out there. They do what they do very well. Their traditions are time honored. They're, they have ethics and integrity and um, you know they deserve the same equal opportunity to get above ground and um, I just really appreciate John very much your presentation and uh, really grateful uh, that you took the time and, and had the passion for it and um, there's a lot of spiritual providers out there that are counting on the board taking these recommendations to heart so thank you. Thank you. Sanctuary. Hey, thanks. Uh, it's it's sanctuary. So just, you know, a reference to psilocybin, our sacred mushrooms. Uh, there's so much to say here. And I just want to reach out. Uh, uh, welcome to anybody that would like to talk to me personally. Um, Eric at sanctuary.org. I've been working with psilocybin for 20 plus years. Sanctuary has been established for going on in a year. Now we've got about 100 members from all around the country. Uh, multiple from Oregon as well. Uh, and, and there are a couple of issues that are really at stake here. The biggest thing that comes to my mind that I think needs to be addressed by the committee is the fact that the DEA is not permitting or is not responding to applications for Schedule One permission for religious exemption. Um, our attorneys who have worked with many, many psychedelic churches have advised us that it is the religious right of the organization to declare its righteousness, if you will, and the burden of proof is on the government, not on the organization to prove to the government that we belong. And then I think that it's really important to point out the fact that these mushrooms in their indigenous use were specifically wild harvested mushrooms. And so to, uh, you know, require that these mushrooms be cultivated only and never be collected when there is such an abundance, particularly in the Pacific Northwest of uh, incredible, incredible wild only sacred mushrooms is really a disservice to the sacredness of the plants that the earth provides us. So there is, there, there's so much more that I'd love to talk about. I'm just really grateful that I was informed of this meeting today. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful, John, your, your uh, presentation was outstanding and I'd love to talk to you personally a little bit more. So uh, I don't wanna take up a lot of time. I just wanna invite anybody that would like to talk with me or my community more about what we're doing uh, to to uh, uh, filter applicants and to really keep everybody safe and uh, please reach out to Eric at sanctuary with a p dot org. Thank you, Eric. Up next we have Kyle Meyer. Thank you. Can you all hear me? This is Kyle yes, Meyer. Can. Okay, thank you. This is Kyle Meyer for the record. Um, I, I want to begin by also echoing uh, the other comments regarding the 
quality of presentations and the speakers that were before the licensing subcommittee today um, and the uh, enormous topical breadth uh, and the importance of all uh, subjects considered. Um, my comments, however, are uh, a, a little more tangential in nature, but um, re really wanting to address something I consider a paradoxical situation with respect to the current licensing categories and being able to expand this program in future years. Now, I, I look at this again from a standpoint of filling in knowledge gaps that are presently readily acknowledged by this board and the research community broadly. Now, to the best of my understanding, if someone wishes to pursue licensure with the state and also seek to achieve federal compliance as well, um, there's an order of operations there that first requires state permission. And if I, assuming I'm not mistaken there, and this points to DEA form 225 again, uh, then there's one category that is not addressed in measure 109 at present in any regard. And that is a research license, which is uh, an, an available category for DEA licensure. Now, in my mind, particularly on the cultivation end, there are certain species that are being considered for recommendation to prohibit in this, at least in this first year of the program, certain species of psilocybin mushrooms, um, particularly those that grow on wood. Now, my, my question is, how do we ever resolve some of the research needs to understand, you know, what, what is the mechanism that is behind phenomena like woodlover's paralysis? What is the mechanism for obtaining that necessary knowledge to be able to then take the necessary steps to expand potential cultivation beyond one species, Psilocybe cubensis, that, that is presently recommended? Um, without some means to address that, and again, not, not with any intent to distribute these species of concern in a cultivation standpoint. I just worry that there's no way to really move this discussion forward without some sort of breach of the system or, or again, some, some sort of underground activity to pursue those questions. So I implore the, the, the board and the licensing subcommittee to consider this issue in terms of being able to address you know, again, many of these critical knowledge gaps and to be able to fill them appropriately through the realm of research. And maybe this could be a subcategorization of an existing license category, which would prevent the need to require a brand new uh, category from the ether, if you will. But I, I, I feel like without creating this opportunity to be able to fill those, those critical knowledge gaps, there won't be opportunity for growth with the program. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Kyle. We still have a couple minutes left in our meeting time. Um, are there any other members of the public who would like to offer comments? Okay, do we have anything additional from uh, board members or uh, members of the licensing subcommittee? Okay, well, this is Anne Marie. Thank you, Jesse, for moderating the uh, public comment. Thank you so much to everyone um, in the public who commented, who joined us here today. Thank you again to our presenters and to everyone on the board and the subcommittee. And um, yeah, everyone have a really good night.